Okay, so greetings. Hello, everyone. So let us welcome you on the fifth uh, ETN training webinar. Uh, today we will learn, learn about basics in calculation positions of our tech aquatic organism. Our today presenter will guide us through approaches such as network analysis, centers of activity, triangulation, gaps, correlated random walks, home range, or resource selection and step selection functions. My name is Maria Prchalová, and together with Renanel uh, Picholt, we lead working group for training and knowledge dissemination of the European tracking network cost action. Today's webinar will be presented by a fish enthusiast, Robert, or Rob uh, uh, Lennox. Rob finished his PhD at Stephen Cook's lab at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, where he was focusing on fish movements, predator prey interactions, applied fisheries issues, and synthesizing important ecological themes. After that, Rob moved to Bergen, Norway, to work at Norwegian Research Center in the Laboratory uh, for Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries. Robert's main research, research topics include fish ecology, habitat relationships, and restoration success, and also conservation behavior. Uh, the today uh, webinar will have the following agenda. At first, we will be introduced to the basics of positioning in acoustic telemetry within Rob's approximately 14 minutes presentation. Afterwards, discussion will be launched. Whenever you have a question or comment, please raise your hand using emoji button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Can you locate it? It's usually on the bottom, but some, some, sometimes it's on the top, something like this. It's under reaction many. Can you find it? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> Perfect, Saron, thanks. Uh, me and Renanel will do our best to keep an eye on raised hands and moderate this, the discussion by calling questioners in order of raised hands. Luckily, hands are displayed <laughs> in the order they were raised in Zoom. So once your question comment is answered, please lower your hand using the same button in case we will not manage to do so. You can also send your question or comment via Zoom chat. And please address it to everyone in the chat to allow everybody to see your comment or question. And also use uh, chat as a platform for question, especially during the presentation. And in case you want to communicate directly with another participant of the webinar, select their name from the drop down menu and send your message privately. And please know that licensed Zoom account we are using for the session also saves the private chat messages, but no worries. Organizers, either account holders, uh, will not access private messages for any purposes. The webinar is recorded and its recording will be uploaded to the ETN YouTube channel. We will notify you via email once the recording is ready to, uh, for review. And we are pleased to see that this topic is of great interest for so many researchers and students. So we have more than 60 uh, registered participants. And right now, we've got around 40 attendees. And I believe that this is all from my side. And now we can proceed to the talk. So please, Rob, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Marie. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time, and I'm so happy to see so many people. Genuinely, thank you for coming. This is going to be incredibly fun. So I'm going to run through this. Uh, presentation of unknown duration, probably between 25 and 45 minutes, 95% confidence interval. Um, please, if you want to interrupt or ask a question, just uh, drop it in the chat. And I know uh, Renal and Marie are going to help out with that. Uh, let's you know try to learn some things together here. And uh, yeah, just you know feel free. So my name is Robert. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Fisheries Robert. 
I'm a senior researcher at NINA, the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research in Trondheim, and I work also at the Norwegian Research Center, uh, where I've worked for the last three years in Bergen. I'm also affiliated with the Ocean Tracking Network and Ideas OTN Committee and uh, with the European Tracking Network as well. Uh, and this is going to be all about, as Marie introduced, positioning aquatic animals with telemetry. And this is going to follow a lot of my own experiences in uh, learning about this field and developing my skills and understanding of, of everything that goes into using uh, acoustic telemetry and, and other tools for this developing positions. And this is uh, two of our uh, fantastic master students at uh, LFI in Bergen and some trout that we were, were tagging a couple of years ago. So I wanna start out a little bit abstract with something called the coastline paradox. And this is something I read about years ago and it's been rattling around in my head for a long time thinking about what it means. And, and the coastline paradox essentially states that you can't actually measure a coastline. If you try, uh, you'll fail because the measurement of a coastline depends on the scale at which you measurement. And here, this is an image from Wikipedia that describes the coastline paradox, showing that depending on where exactly you decide to measure and how fine grain you decide to, to make your your intervals, you'll get a different measurement. And that's part of the reason that depending on how you measure, Norway may have a longer coastline than Australia. But if you measure it a different way, it'll be uh, a different length because it all depends on the scale that you measure at. And that's because it's, the coastlines are fractals, which is a curve whose length depends on the resolution of measurement. And that, you're probably wondering why I open with that, but that's why, but that's essentially what an animal movement path is. And that's often what we're measuring. We're measuring these curves uh, at different measurement resolutions. And we have one of the important considerations when using telemetry tools and when trying to track animals is to understand that these are indeed fractals and that the, the scale at which we have information is going to determine what we can do with it and what we understand about the animals. This is a beautiful fractal pattern. Uh, there's an entire journal called Fractals. I'm not the first, obviously, to come up with this, although I just sort of made the connection with the coastline paradox and I went to read about it. There's lots of papers talking about animal movement as fractals and, and what that means, and it's very interesting. And uh, I didn't get a chance to read it all, but I will continue to read into that because fractals are amazing, very cool. Uh, and, and I think it's really key to understand uh, when we're talking about positioning because we can, we can use different sensor types in telemetry that measure... Uh, or we can we can uh, code our transmitters to transmit on different frequencies to get different inter intervals of information that will provide us different resolution of uh, of data and that'll determine how accurately we can position what we can do with that. So tracking animals underwater. Uh, this is Rand Nathan's amazing PNAS paper from uh, 2008 with the animal movement framework. Uh, I've cited this many times. I've read it even more, strongly recommended. I'm sure most people have read it, uh, showing basically how uh, animal, di different factors, uh, internal and external affect uh, animal movement and a really nice conceptual figure on uh, a series of positions that form a path essentially. So the path is what we're after when we're positioning animals and when we're using telemetry tools to try to uh, understand and reconstruct where animals are going, why and when, any questions that we're trying to answer, we're trying to get as close as we can, in theory, to that animal's path. And, and going back to the fractals, it all, it all depends on the scale at which we measure it. But it, in theory, the, an, animal's, an animal's true path is, is a series, is not, not really a series of changes in positions the way we measure it. It's more of a uh, a, a much longer term ongoing process that involves really, really fine scale uh, movements down to sub second level uh, uh, changes in position and posture and everything. And we, we can't always accurately measure that. We have to approximate it using these, uh, using these changes in position that we get with, uh, with different telemetry tags. So uh, Rand Nathan works a lot with birds and bats and has the, the great joy of using GPS tags that connect to GPS and get the, the positions with very high accuracy at very, very frequent intervals. And we don't really have that in, in aquatic ecology. As you all know, we, we are dealing with much more difficult data. Uh, and that's, that's why this is uh, an interesting subject, an interesting talk. Fish movement, when we're talking about pads, this is a, an unpublished figure from Al Dr. Alex Falous. Uh, is working in Palau on some uh, 
between megafaunal movements with uh, satellite tags that are take, that are using uh, light-based geolocation. And he's getting paths from his yellowfin tuna, his sailfish, his blue marlin. Uh, but these paths are based on data collected at sunrise and sunset because that's how, how the light-based geolocation works. And he's getting at best two positions per day to see the trajectory of the fish. And you can see that even with two positions per day, you can start to see uh, movement patterns emerge. But of course, those that that's a, a, just a small subsample of the movement. So between these positions, they're doing all sorts of things: they're turning in circles, going up and down in the water column, on and on and on. But you can see the the elephant tuna are moving more directionally. Uh, the marlin are moving a little bit more uh, tortuously. So this is the exclusive economic zone around Palau and. Uh, there's sea mounts around here that they're moving, they're sort of turning on and feeding on most likely. And, and you can start to see when we have these paths from these type of tags, we can start to understand behavior, migration, uh, a large number of different things about ecology. But this is a huge scale. This is an entire, you know, you can see uh, Indonesia, New Guinea, and this is, uh, it, you know, a, a sea scale, essentially. It's a huge part of the of the Pacific Ocean that we're tracking across and with, with satellite tags. When we zoom out that far, we get this, this picture of the, this movement uh, at this scale that is, is more relevant when we have two positions per day or even one position per day, if, if you're not lucky. Um, and when we're more often, we're working with acoustic telemetry on much smaller scales, we're getting uh, more positions per day. Uh, and this is a this is from a paper that we worked on through the European Tracking Network and uh, a workshop led by Ivan Yarich in uh, in Czech Republic, looking at uh, acoustic telemetry in lakes. So uh, many of you, of course, uh, are familiar, very familiar with acoustic telemetry. But we have the sound transmissions. Uh, it's a, a reverse GPS form of of positioning and getting fixes. So instead of linking the tag directly to a GPS, we know the location of the receiver by GPS and then uh, the detection of the tag on the, G on, on the receiver is cross referenced back to the GPS location of that receiver and we infer the position. Uh, raw positions uh, on, uh, in a telemetry array, this is a lake in Czech Republic. Uh, raw positions can uh, be useful, but obviously the, when you have overlapping receivers in this grid type array, uh, you don't know exactly where the animal is, uh, but it, you, using triangulation techniques, to get positions, you can get trajectories. Uh, you can have sensor data on board. You can you can do three dimensional home ranges, uh, two dimensional home ranges. Look at activity, uh, and then that's sort of where we'll get to later in the talk. But the, these acoustic telemetry tools provide as much higher resolution uh, data than the satellite tags in in the open ocean, uh, and and it's much more zoomed in, much more frequent positions. And there's a lot of different things that we can do with it. Detection data. So detection data is what we essentially get a uh, most basic form of telemetry data on acoustic receivers. We know the location of our receivers. We put our tags out. We say, okay, this receiver is at a certain location. A fish was detected there. So most likely the fish was within a certain range of that receiver. Uh, Kim Wariski, uh, Dr. Kim Wariski published this fantastic review that I was happy to be a part of on uh, analyzing detection data with telemetry. Uh, and uh, it is, it's quite different from having paths because you, have, you really uh, you can only draw uh, lines and networks between receivers when you don't have a, a precise position. You only know generally where the, the fish was and within a range of a receiver. And this is obviously greatly affected by receiver range. If you have receiver ranges that are two, three kilometers, hypothetically, then you only really know that uh, a fish was within two, two or three kilometers of a location. So you, you, you don't really have known positions of animals. So you can draw networks. And uh, again, this is a nice figure from uh, Alex Flus's work on yellowfin tuna and Palau going uh, between different uh, uh, fads. So fish aggregating devices off the coast of Palau and they had different, uh, different yellowfin tuna, young of the year and year one tuna and, and looking at how they were connected to the different, uh, different fads and how much they're moving within this fad network. Uh, in Kim Wariski's paper, there was uh, uh, an example of using a network analysis on receivers in uh, an abatement in British Columbia on bull trout, uh, and and seeing how the how the movements between receivers uh, were derived. And and this isn't really positioning; it's coarse type of positioning because you're saying, okay, these these fish or these animals are moving 
generally in between these areas. We don't know anything in between. We just know that at some point it was here and then it was there and you draw the line in between. And this is, this is very useful. They're, they're very good tools uh, in Florida. The Acoustic Telemetry uh, Network uh, FACT and, and ITAG have uh, put out this fascinating, uh, amazing study on networks of all sorts of different species in the Florida Keys from uh, sharks to groupers and amberjack, the snappers. Uh, and you can start to see how functional movement classes start to emerge uh, within these networks. And you can see that the, the sharks are more mobile, the, uh, the permit are using all sorts of different habitat. And then you have snappers, smaller, more resident species using much smaller networks. And networks work, work really well. Uh, LED Lede, uh, who did this, uh, published this, Dr. LED Lede uh, published this fantastic study on uh, a comparison between network methods and and kernel methods, which, which I'll touch on in a moment, uh, showing that uh, you can get similar types of information uh, with kernel methods, which are, which are more familiar for continuous types of data that you would get from satellite tags or positioning. Uh, you can get similar type data using these network analyses where you're uh, looking at the strength of, uh, of movements between nodes. So in a network, you have your receiver nodes and you have your edges moving uh, or connecting different receivers. And uh, you can summarize networks based on the number of movements and the type of movements uh, in between uh, different network nodes, uh, degree centrality, uh, degree betweenness, things like that. And essentially, uh, the, the takeaway here is that depending on what you're trying to do, you, you don't always need to use precise positioning methods in order to understand the spatial configuration of animal movements within an array. So you see uh, in this in this Australian array, uh, you can get strong inference about uh, the the fidelity of animals to these sort of central areas using uh, a type of positioning method, which would be home range as well as a network. So that's a, a quick overview of of networks and and how I view networks as as a tool and an important uh, uh, important component of the telemetry analyst's toolbox based on the study design that you have and the questions that you have. Uh, but we can move more into positions. So positions a location in two or three dimensional space at a given time, basically. And we can have imprecise positioning. This is a a photograph in, uh, in, of an atoll in French Polynesia uh, in Anna and the pass out of the, out of the atoll. And uh, imprecise positioning essentially means that uh, you can estimate or you can interpolate a position uh, based on uh, known positions. So calculation of autocorrelated movements, it's not quite a path, but you're getting closer to a path and common to use uh, for home range, core area, resource selection, et cetera. But you, you have to have coverage. So you need to have, uh, in order to estimate positions, uh, even imprecisely, you need to have a, a receiver array that, that covers the area fairly well that you're trying to work within. So a, a very familiar example of these imprecise positioning methods would be uh, centers of activity. Colin Simferdorfer's paper from 2002 was sort of the first to develop this idea. And uh, Vinay Udwyer in Methods in Ecology and Evolution uh, presented uh, a, a package basically built around this concept of activity within an acoustic receiver array to start to calculate uh, home range using uh, kernel methods. So uh, Brownian bridge kernel utilization distribution is a common one that they use uh, in this package. And essentially, uh, these centers of activity are calculated using uh, an interval, a time interval, and simply a weighted mean. So a mean, the mean longitude and the mean latitude within an interval, say it's 15 minutes, five minutes, an hour. Uh, and that gives you an imprecise position, essentially. And the, the concept, as described in Colin, Simferdorf's, Colin Simferdorfer's paper, is that uh, uh, more nearby receivers are more likely to detect uh, approximate tag than more distant receivers are to, to detect that tag. So given that, it is most likely that uh, it is most likely that the animal will be closer to the uh, to the receiver that is uh, registering more detections within a detection interval. Uh, and you can estimate that the position must be therefore closer to that receiver. 
the Symfondorfer paper specifies specifically that this works for receivers that have overlapping detection ranges. More and more, I am seeing it applied to uh, receiver arrays that do not have overlapping detection ranges. I do not know for sure if that is uh, viable or not. Uh, I haven't read much validation research showing whether or not that uh, non-overlapping receivers can be used for centers of activity, but it seems to be uh, increasingly common. And once you have centers of activity within a certain uh, time or at a certain, certain time scale, say 15 minutes, you can start to estimate paths and you can start to estimate uh, kernel, kernel, kernel utilization distributions like we see here with the Browning bridge, uh, minimum convex polygons. You can see here that overlaps land, which is not super helpful, uh, but, but these centers of activities are uh, in high demand, I perceive. Uh, John, I mean, uh, John Pai, who we participate in the OTN study halls, which are Thursday nights. Everybody should join. Uh, if you're available, they're very fun and informative. And lots of people are, are, are wanting to calculate centers of activity from their data, often using the VTRAC package. Uh, I should have put a little bit, bit of code in here, but it's very simple to just calculate centers of activity by grouping your detections by ID and a time interval and saying, give me the mean longitude, mean latitude, then you have a center of activity and you can proceed if that's what you want to do. Uh, Richard Hedger and Fred Wariski, I think I saw Fred sign into the call, so hello, uh, nice to see you, um, uh, published this paper in 2008 on uh, methods of interpolating positions from overlapping receivers. This is, again, not an extremely precise form of positioning, although they compared uh, multiple different types of algorithms that could potentially be used to uh, estimate the uh, time difference of arrival at different receivers based on, based on detection data and found that uh, based on simulations with a uh, boat, they could actually get fairly precise paths through this very dense receiver array. Uh, and they found very importantly that uh, the, the success of this really depended on uh, the range of the receiver. So transmission range being 500 meters allowed this receiver grid to have overlapping detections, whereas the transmission range was only about uh, 200 meters, uh, no longer was the detection range overlapping, and that affected the ability with which they could uh, position the animals. So uh, they were studying Atlantic salmon migrations out of rivers in Quebec here. So this is 62 receivers, 507 meter, 507 meter hexagons approximately. Uh, and this method did not account for clock drift. Uh, so the, the receiver clocks were not synchronized, uh, but they, they still were able to estimate positions with, with fairly good accuracy. And Megan Winton uh, improved upon this recently, a spatial point process model uh, for individual centers of activity. So here's the mean weighted centers of activity that I was discussing. Uh, again, simply a time interval with the mean, uh, mean longitude, mean latitude for each individual. Uh, and with the, the spatial point process, you get more of a, 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 a likelihood distribution. So you can see more uh, accurately uh, where the animal's position and they found that it did it did perform better than the simple mean weighted in, in a lot of different simulations as well as uh, in a uh, in a field test uh, they did point out that uh, it takes hours to run even for small data sets and we run into this problem kind of over and over again with our positioning where the best methods are almost inaccessible to uh, mortals with small computers uh, actually using this spatial point process model to identify centers of activity seems uh, logistically unlikely for most people that are dealing with realistic data sets for animals that are spending months or even years within a telemetry array and trying to understand where they're going and, uh, and what their centers of activity are. So I have not seen this applied very often. The, it's cited a lot by review papers, I think, uh, pointing out that this is a, a good method. Uh, I have not seen a lot of people actually using this, uh, this spatial point process model to calculate their centers of activity and then proceed uh, to develop a, a pseudo path based on the centers of activity and then uh, use an analysis like a kernel utilization distribution to calculate a range.
So juicing the orange, a, a lot of, uh, more and more I see studies that are uh, not, uh, not concerned about the coverage of their receivers. Uh, here you can see this, this very good uh, daily at all paper in, uh, uh, in MEPS, the Marine Ecology Progress Series. And, and I'm not saying anything negative about this paper. It's a very cool paper. I love Giant Trevally. I, I think I was a review, reviewer on this paper. Uh, it's very cool, important, conservation relevant. Uh, I'm merely bringing it up as an example of uh, a frontier a little bit in, in our understanding of how these receiver arrays perform in, in field tests. Um, I think my comments as a reviewer were that it, it should focus a little bit more on network analysis because they have a very nice network here. It's very dense. Uh, and these offshore receivers that they have are not really arranged in a way that, that can be used efficiently for uh, calculating uh, home range metrics like Brownian bridge kernel utilization distribution or minimum convex polygons. Uh, but they do calculate these minimum po convex polygons based on the, the activity space of these giant trevally. Beautiful fish, uh, very cool. Uh, this is in the Seychelles, amazing study system. Uh, and you can see that they're they're estimating that the uh, minimum convex polygons of these animals is is fairly large. But but in fact, because they they don't have any coverage really outside. I'm using this pointer, like you can see. I don't know if you maybe I can make this a laser pointer give me a chance to catch my breath. Uh, you can see that the, there's no receiver sort of out here. So the giant trevally that they, they may be swimming like this and then all up here, you know, up to, you know, down to Mexico and back and you'd never know because there's no receivers there. So they just say, okay, this is the minimum convex polygon and the area used by this giant trevally. Uh, but in fact, that's, that's, we know for sure that's definitely underestimating the actual area used by the giant trevally. It's going way outside of the array. There's not very many receivers to to cover uh, the potential movement use. And I think we need to think carefully and critically about how we apply these methods like home range, which includes BBKUD, minimum convex polygons, um, and so on. Uh, KUD is just normal kernel utilization distributions. Uh, I think we need to think critically about how we apply these to uh, receiver networks where we don't have full coverage. Uh, and, and, and it's potentially a useful comparison within the study for uh, giant Trevally to to say okay you know large ones had larger home ranges but we couldn't th this doesn't provide comparable or usable results uh, when we try to contrast this with other research on giant Trevally for example that, that would potentially use continuous methods with with lots of positions where they could swim swim out oh, I guess you can probably see this on the top but it's uh, so considerations for positioning, uh, a big thing is really how many receivers you're going to have, uh, whether you're trying to do precise positioning or not, that's always going to be a big question. Uh, the Hedger et al. paper that I presented, uh, they found that 60% of transmissions uh, from the tags they calculated based on the known transmission intervals uh, were not heard by any receivers. And they had only 500 meters in between their receivers, a very, very dense grid, uh, and, and more than half of the detections were just never heard. Uh, tag power, which is measured in decibels, something that I, I never really thought too much about uh, initially. Now, I, it, reading reading and thinking about how, how I'm going to do positioning, uh, I realized that the tag power I really need to focus on, really need to think about how can we get how can we get the highest power tags that are most likely to have the longest transmission distances. Uh, I need to read more into this. Uh, I think this is worth discussing as well. I saw uh, there's some, some representatives from different manufacturers. I should be I should be discussing this more when when purchasing tags and thinking about okay what is the decibel output and and what's the likely range I would love to see in the future uh, some papers looking at uh, estimating the transmission distances of tags with different decibels uh, it's something that either I've missed in the literature or is not extremely uh, well developed and fully discussed uh, different people will surely have different opinions on that I'm sure the manufacturers uh, know their know, know their stuff better than I do on that and tag transmission rate and, and battery life as well. So the more transmissions that you're getting or uh, that you're giving, the more likely you are to have a precise position. So in, in the Hedger study where they found only 60%, only 40% of transmissions were ever heard by their receivers. Uh, had there been more transmissions, potentially you have a higher likelihood of having more, uh, more detections and then you have a better probability of, of 
uh, getting more precise positions. And receiver clock drift, uh, that is something I'll get into in a moment, but uh, all clocks drift and, and as they drift, the, the ability for two receivers to, or two detection, one detection on multiple receivers to be well understood with re regards to where that detection is coming from uh, becomes rapidly very unreliable and how much error is acceptable. So uh, I showed a couple of, uh, of examples where uh, paths are not entirely accurate or uh, home range distributions are not entirely reflective of the true home range. Uh, but we know that we know that when we're using technology to track animals underwater, it's an amazing thing. It's unbelievable that we're able to do it at all. Uh, how, how much, of course, we're going to have error. How much of that is going to be is acceptable? Uh, you know, we can still sleep at, at night knowing that you know we have a little bit of uh, a little bit of error, but we're getting close positions and 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 semi accurate positions from uh, from calculations like centers of activity in some cases. But this is something that analysts need to think about and need to contemplate before designing studies and say, okay, uh, you know, at what point is is uh, our, our positions accurate enough for our purposes? And applying positioning quickly, there's some amazing things that we can do with positioning, uh, whether it's it's precise positioning or imprecise positioning. And I will get to precise positioning in a moment. Uh, this is Luke Griffin's uh, 2021 paper in front, Dr. Luke Griffin's paper in uh, Frontiers in Marine Science. Really cool stuff. I saw this paper and I thought, wow, that is cool. That is a, a, a really nice approach. And they use resource selection functions uh, and they had really nice precise habitat mapping uh, of this, this coastal area with, uh, with reef and mud and, and land and uh, all the different habitat types available to these, uh, these species. And they could see how exactly uh, these animals were selecting, uh, selecting different habitats based on these centers of activity and, and relatively imprecise positions. So they didn't have to be, they didn't have to have sub meter or, or one meter accuracy in their positions in order to be confident that the animals were uh, using these habitats and, and selecting these habitats and, uh, and getting management relevant uh, information about the the site attachment or the different site attachments of these, these various species. Okay, uh, 10 second break. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, I got my breath again. So from, so from paths uh, using imprecise positioning to paths from precise positioning. And a path is what I, Refer what I think of as a high dimensional fractal connecting a series of positions. So we don't actually get paths from any kind of telemetry data that we use. We get positions and we draw a path in between those positions. And that's where the fractal nature of this comes in because the more positions we have, the more accurate our path will be and the more tortuous and twisty and windy and sinuous, the paths will be as a nature of the fact that we have more positions. So I'm gonna bring back this figure uh, just because I, I, I like showing how these, these paths can, can emerge from this triangulated data. So this, this lake in the Czech Republic, we have these raw positions of these, these two, these tench, uh, or this tench in the Wells catfish, and then we can start to develop the, the path based on triangulation. Uh, of the detections in this receiver grid. It's unbelievable to me, again, always, and I'll never stop enjoying it, the fact that we can get these, this level of detail about animals living under the water. And I never would have believed it growing up, and now here we are, look at it, it's, it's fascinating. So getting a path is not easy in water, a, a, a true path. I showed you uh, Alex's uh, research in Palau, looking at the, at path data from uh, sunrise, sunset times, and light-based geolocation of the, of the marine pelagics. Uh, uh, in, in Australia, they've shown how you can use uh, toad floats with GPS tags, and you can start to pretend like you're a terrestrial biologist uh, working with, with satellites and GPS. Must be amazing. Uh, so, so floats basically on the surface with a satellite uh, uplinked GPS tag, that's getting dragged around by these uh, these stingrays in this shallow bay, and you're able to get a, a much better series of positions uh, and and 
they sort of uh, tested the method and showed whether or not uh, it's uh, or how useful it can, it can potentially be. But we, I mean, this isn't practical for most species. Stingrays, they're you know flat as pancakes, fly, you know, flying around on on uh, on relatively shallow substrate. It's a perfect perfect setup for this. But you can't you can't tow a float on a uh, a giant trevally or or a snook or uh, or an Atlantic salmon, for example. It's just not going to work. It's impractical. It would be bizarre for people to be sitting next to a river watching a salmon try to tow a float up a river. Um, so we use triangulation, which is essentially, uh, or, or tri trilateralization, where uh, signals are detected by multiple receivers with overlapping detection ranges, uh, and we're able to uh, estimate the position based on time difference of arrival at different receivers. Uh, and this is, this is a fantastic paper by uh, Anna Steele you know, on performance of, uh, of these uh, positioning uh, systems using triangulation. And, and they have a really nice uh, figure in there looking at uh, all the things that can affect the, the accuracy of these, these precise positioning systems. And you have user controlled variables, so uh, receiver geometry. This is uh, obviously one of the most important things that you can do is set up your array properly uh, so that the distances between receivers or among receivers are uh, small enough that you can get oops uh, that you can get uh, uh, overlapping detections receiver movement as well as is within within control of the analyst uh, if you moor them in a way that ensures that their positions will be uh, fixed you're going to have a much better higher chance of success uh, you need to understand the study system of course water movement uh, currents and and uh, and weather patterns like potentially storms or storm surges, hurricanes can affect your your positioning systems, uh, lead to great heartbreak. Uh, but there's other factors that are going to affect uh, the performance of these positioning systems because temperature and conductivity affect the density of water or the properties of water and the sound transmission. So the the transmission distance of tags through water is going to change uh, throughout a study. Uh, boats, wind and waves, uh, biological organisms like pistol shrimp, uh, all sorts of things uh, can really affect your ability to, to detect your fish. And, and this means a lot of testing is, is really necessary in order to set up a, a proper positioning array. So this is a, this is a really nice example from, uh, from France, from Eroua et al. Uh, <clears throat> looking at, uh, at this reservoir they set up uh, receivers in the reservoir and did uh, uh, tag toes through the through the array uh, and and triangulated positions using the the Vemco VPS system uh, and looked at the probability of location. So they said there there were some serious uh, dead spots based on their receiver uh, network array, and you can see that these are areas where uh, there's not good triangulation of receivers. So back here, there's no there's no third receiver essentially that they can get. So it's, it's a bit of a quiet spot for detecting, detecting the tags. Uh, the, these types of positioning systems, uh, the Vemco VPS give uh, horizontal positioning error, the HPE, uh, and, and different fill. There's, there's a variety of different strategies used for filtering HPE that I have not uh, gone into much in, in this talk. There's, a, there's several papers that discuss how, strategies and best practices for filtering HP. My understanding is this, this is still uh, an ongoing topic of research in the community, term, trying to determine how best to account for hor horizontal positioning error, error or how to filter it. Uh, but uh, in, in this study, when they, when they uh, filtered out uh, horizontal positioning error, they were able to, to achieve a fairly good positioning uh, accuracy, mostly within about two to five meters throughout the entire reservoir. So that's pretty good. You have positions within two to five meters. Uh, you should be pretty happy with that, I think. And triangulation, uh, it all depends on this, this time difference of arrival at, at known locations. This is a figure from Henrik Back, Dr. Henrik Backtoff's uh, study uh, on, on these positioning systems. Uh, using open source uh, software, uh, YAPS, which Henrik developed. Uh, it, it all depends on, on knowing the speed of sound through water, which of course is, uh, is, is constant and synchronizing the clocks. Uh, and that's something I didn't mention in the previous slide, but, but making sure that these, these receivers are able to talk to, uh, to, talk to each other in a, way, in a, in a sense, uh, basically more after the fact in your data that you're able to actually uh, 
uh, understand how how a tag transmission from a loca an, uh, an unknown location will travel, how long it will take to travel to these receivers, uh, allows you to estimate the, the position. You can see Henrik's done a nice uh, uh, towed experiment where he's towed a tag through the array with a GPS uh, and then estimated the, position, the positions of that tag and turned it into a path by drawing lines through it. Uh, you can see it's quite accurate. This is going to give us really nice, beautiful uh, path data uh, for these animals moving through this array. It's amazing when it works. It's compl complicated math. Uh, I've played around with yaps. Uh, it's very fun. Uh, Henrik's, uh, Henrik's very helpful. I appreciate all the, the responses to my emails, uh, and, and I was able to, to start to get it to work. This is a really fantastic example. Just came out, Aspalaga et al. Uh, 2021 in animal biotelemetry. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, equilateral triangles, uh, receivers in a, a coastal array around Majorca. You can see a very small, dense receiver array, only 50 meters in between receivers. Uh, and they used a correlated random walk uh, to smooth the locations and estimate the, uh, the positions of the tags and then uh, basically connect those positions to generate a path. And uh, the, the, this, uh, this turned into a really fascinating study on pearly razorfish, which is a small wrasse that lives in the sand. Uh, it's a very popular recreational fishery species, uh, and they were able to show uh, how social networks emerged in these RAS based on uh, the fine scale associations and disassociations among individuals uh, throughout the year. Uh, very fascinating study and really shows the power of what you can do when you can really get these paths at, at fine resolution. This is tags pinging at uh, you know two minutes or less uh, intervals, so you're able to, to really understand uh, where and when these animals are swimming and what they're doing in, uh, in real time and, and high dimensional, or in, in, with high dimensionality. I want to just uh, go back to the, the power transmission quickly. Uh, the Aspilaga study at all uses low tech, which uh, uh, has a tag type called JSAT, which is a juvenile salmon acoustic telemetry tag. It's about the smallest family of tags you can get in, uh, in acoustic telemetry. Uh, uh, down to about 0 0.32 grams, but they're really high power. So the tags they were using in the Aspilaga study at all, uh, they reported were 158 decibels. And I just went through some of the manufacturers quickly and uh, found uh, the Vemco V5s, 180 kilohertz, 143 decibels, uh, up to Telma medium power, 13 millimeters, 153 decibels. So you can see you have these ranges of, uh, of power outputs and uh, and and need to understand really how the power output of the tag is likely to affect the transmission distance, which is likely to affect the uh, detection probability, which is then going to determine uh, the likelihood of success when trying to uh, triangulate or trilateralize a position uh, from a detection within a receiver array. The sequence uh, of the pings is extremely important. Uh, Henrik Backtoft's uh, study in, in BioArchive uh, really really shows how uh, knowing when you expect a tag to ping because of course because we, these acoustic tags have a uh, have a pseudo random sequence of pings in order to reduce the collisions uh, among the tags so if you know exactly when to expect the next ping uh, you can determine whether or not a ping was heard or not and that allows you to uh, to generate a more precise position when you have those sequences. So it's, it's very important when doing these studies uh, to discuss with the manufacturers and get the, the ping sequences uh, so that you can parse through them as, as, uh, as you're conducting these triangulation or trilateralization uh, uh, analyses. And synchronizing clocks. So uh, I mentioned before, all clocks drift, uh, just a, uh, a fact of physics, I guess. Uh, and, and sound travels fast, it's 1.5 kilometers. Uh, and tiny differences among receivers really throws off calculations. So if you can't synchronize your clocks, if all of a sudden uh, one, of your, one of your receiver clocks is racing ahead of the other, uh, then the, your ability to understand how uh, the tag detection at, at, at those two receivers uh, is synchronized becomes uh, totally off. So we use synchronization tags uh, in our arrays a lot of the time, uh, they, they're pinging at a known frequency, 
Uh, they need to be heard by multiple receivers so that those two receivers can basically have their clocks adjusted. Yaps has an amazing integrated model. Uh, uh, I've talked to a few people. Everybody says it's it's unbelievable that uh, that it works so well. Uh, it's a total mystery to to me and many others, I think. But uh, Henrik's a genius, and he was able to figure it out. And you get these really nice synchronizations uh, for your models, and it's it's right integrated right into Yap. So you you put your uh, you input your receiver data and your sync tag data, and you get your receivers all synced up so you can triangulate. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great tool. Uh, the alternative is to, is to link your receivers by cables underwater. Certain manufacturers allow you to do this. You basically plug them all into the same thing, and then you plug, uh, or not thing, uh, you plug them all into each other and then to a timekeeper. And so all their clocks are synchronized remotely by a, a, a common timekeeping device. The tools we have for triangulation for many people, Vemco VPS is most familiar. Vemco v VPS is Vemco positioning system. Lots of people just refer to triangulation as VPS, but of course there's lots of different ways to do this. I showed the Aspalaga study that uses the low-tech receivers. Uh, Henrik's been doing this with, uh, with Telma and low-tech receivers. Uh, you can use a correlated random walk with the crawl package in R, uh, which uh, Aspalaga et al. Uh, used in their study in Mallorca. Yaps is the best. It's my personal favorite. Uh, I'm biased a little bit because I know Henrik and I've worked, I've, it's, it's the main one that I've used and I know that it works really well. It's open source, it's flexible. Uh, you can use all sorts of different tags and receiver types. Uh, I'm grateful to Henrik as we all should be that he's taken the time to develop this uh, for everybody in the community to use. It's, it's available on CRAN um, and, and it works incredibly well. The, the papers show the validations and show that that it's a very good tool. Uh, but there's no free lunch. Uh, it, you can't just plug data into YAPS. You can't just send Vem, uh, Vemco a bunch of data. Uh, you need to make sure that receivers are well placed. You need to make sure that the clocks can be synchronized with sync tags or some other method. And you need to make sure that your tags are moving through your array. So if you design an array that uh, is not going to, where the fish are going to move in and out of, you're not going to get very good path data. You're going to get intermittent movements in and out of the array and, and whatever analyses you, you want to conduct with triangulation uh, are going to be thrown off. So Henrik's got this amazing YAPS tutorial on YouTube uh, based on his, his YAPS package uh, last year, I guess, feels like a million years ago, but it was only last year. Uh, through Ocean Tracking Network, we put on a uh, student success workshop with all sorts of different talks. Henrik was uh, kind enough to join us for that and gave uh, an extremely thorough uh, presentation on how to use YAPS. I thought maybe I should maybe I should go through how to use YAPS in this talk today. And then I thought, well, that makes no sense. Henrik's talk is available for everybody for free at any time at your convenience on YouTube. And Henrik knows much more about this than I do, so. Uh, it, it makes much more sense to point you towards this tutorial. Uh, whether you are interested in using it specifically or not, I highly recommend it. You will learn a lot more about positioning. You'll be smarter for having watched it. Uh, and you will, you will uh, even if you're not working with, with YAPS or positioning at the moment, it will give you some ideas for how you may apply this in the future. I highly recommend it. <laughs> so once you have these positions, uh, you can start to draw paths. So Shannon Landowskis, uh very kindly provided this to me. Uh, I asked her as nicely as I could because I knew that she had some amazing examples. Uh, this is unpublished, so uh, uh, enjoy it now, but uh, yeah, don't take pictures of it and, and share it around because it, she wants to publish it. Uh, and Shannon has these uh, lobsters from the Bredore Lakes uh, in Canada, in Nova Scotia. They're walking around the substrate, uh, really nice, precise uh, maps of the substrate and the lakes. You have till, uh, these soft sediment areas, coarse sediment uh, and mud. Uh, and Shannon had a, a Vemco VPS array uh, for the lobsters and was able to get these position, precise positions for all the lobsters uh, and, and use this uh, to develop paths. And she used something called step selection functions, which uh, are a very cool map method of analysis, mostly used in telemetry, I think, Shan or in terrestrial telemetry. I think Shannon's one of the first to really apply these to uh, acoustic telemetry data, very exciting. Uh, and you can look and see how the different individuals are selecting uh, different substrates. So you can see just visually on this, this map, essentially, 
uh, that there's there's evidence that certain lobsters uh, are are using certain substrates preferentially. And you can see just a, a quick snapshot of that. You can start to look at the relative selection strength of, of the lobsters on different substrates. Johannes Singer, uh, Signer is a very nice guy, very, very intelligent, very, uh, very impressive package that he's developed here, AMT. I, uh, I don't see it used in aquatic telemetry very often, but I think it's amazing. The applications are exciting. There's lots we can do with this uh, as it continues to develop. I've, I contacted Johannes for a couple of uh, questions about step selection functions. Uh, he was very kind to provide some answers. Uh, he's excited by trying to integrate this into more uh, aquatic research. I think I hope that people use this with their uh, with their uh, positioning data more because I think that this is a really cool and important method that we have now or tool that we have now to better utilize positioning data to understand uh, ecology of animals, especially as it come, as it uh, pertains to habitat selection. And another great example, uh, Nathan Batchelor in, uh, in fisheries research. I, I think this is a fantastic paper, one of my favorites possibly, uh, on uh, precise using precise positioning of these gray trigger fish in Carolina. Um, they have this grid array and they have these positions and, and they're able to develop paths for these trigger fish. And they use something called hidden Markov models, which essentially use the trajectories and uh, the, the step lengths, so the distance between uh, positions and the turning angles, so essentially the, the compass orientation between positions to try to understand how uh, different, uh, different changes in positions, so different movements, uh, reflect different behaviors or different, uh, different components of the behavioral repertoire. So this three-state hidden Markov model that they apply to this, these path data uh, for all of their animals show that uh, there's uh, a state number one, which is a uh, very small step length. So you can see the distribution of step lengths for, step, for state one is very small, uh, and the turning angle distribution is, is kind of flat. Um, you can see that there's a, a state three as well, that there's a, more of a, a long distribution of step lengths. So this can be both or mostly longer step lengths, and you see it's uh, it the step lengths are more uh, oriented towards zero turning angles. So that would be straight line movements uh, at a relatively fast speed. So that's state three. Uh, state one would be more uh, resting, so slower movements. You can see small step lengths, uh, maybe area restricted, they're turning a little bit. But, uh, and, and state two, you see that there's uh, a longer tail than, than state one. There may be a little bit longer steps and a very flat uh, distribution of turning angles that may be turning a lot. And there we can see that the, these, these different behaviors are, are partitioned through the day. It's amazing. You can see what these trigger fish are, are actually, how they're behaving uh, throughout the, an, entire, uh, an entire day. So local time, I don't know what the x-axis actually is here. I assume it's one to 24. And you can see sort of later in the day, they're more likely to be in state three, which we, inferred is this long step length, this uh, really directional movements. They're traveling late in the day. They're resting early in the day. It's that's unbelievable. And you can map it onto the onto the spatial positions and actually see, okay, these are hot spots for uh, behavior one. These are hot spots for behavior two. Uh, they're doing a lot of behavior three in these areas, which I guess is traveling. So uh, you can and you can start to map this onto habitats and really learn about the ecology of these animals. Okay, some concluding thoughts. I have no idea how long this has taken. I said 25 to 45 minutes. I think I'm probably within that window, right? Um, so positioning problem, we really only have presence and absence data at receiver locations. And look at all that we're able to do with that when we put these positions, when, when we put this data together and start to try to estimate. Uh, we can only really make inferences within your receiver race. So small fish that are relatively area restricted are generally ideal unless you have a lot of receivers. It's possible to massively misestimate a lot of parameters if movement occurs beyond the array. I showed that example with the, with the giant trevally in the Seychelles. So that, that's giving a, a poor estimate of the total home range of the fish, uh, but it, it may be relevant or it may be useful for, for a certain purpose. Uh, you're missing data on untagged animals, which we can never forget. So I showed the examples with the lobsters moving on the, habit, on the different habitat types. Uh, it's really important to think about how 
uh, untagged animals in that area may be affecting the habitat selection of the lobster. So you can have bold and shy individuals and the shy ones may be selecting a certain habitat because they're pushed off of the optimal habitat by others that you can't see. Uh, and, and these methods often work best for lakes, embayments, really massive arrays, uh, or sedentary species that aren't moving very much. And we have amazing opportunities with this. We can study habitat selection, we can study competition, uh, uh, we can study, study predator-prey dynamics and disease, uh, fishing effects. So uh, there's amazing study by Chris Monk et al., Dr. Chris Monk et al., uh, uh, in, in uh, Proceedings in National Academy of Science on uh, reality mining of, of fishing systems in Germany. Uh, lands, you can study landscapes of fear, energy landscapes, environmental influences on movement, uh, treatment control experiments in replicated ponds or lakes or bays, uh, and, you can really, and you can conduct reality mining. A really fascinating paper by Krauss et al. 2013 in Trends in Ecology and Evolution talking about reality mining using machine sensed data to understand. Uh, ecological systems. A uh, quick note on computing. Uh, your RAM on your computer is going to really determine how successful you are with a lot of these positioning algorithms. I referenced uh, uh, Megan Winton's study on the, the spatial point processes uh, for positioning uh, centers of activity and how uh, they mentioned that it took a really long time, even with a small data set. Well, uh, a lot of the large positioning algorithms like YAPS, uh, they, they can uh, need to think about how much RAM you have, how many cores you have. Uh, my computer, for example, has 16 gigabytes of RAM. I talked to Josep Alos, uh, Spanish National Research Council. He uses 46 cores and 256 gigabytes of RAM, which is about 16 uh, computers in one. Uh, and Ruben Pierre et al., uh, or I guess not at all, it's just the master's thesis that I found, uh, really recommends that a GPU over a CPU, so graphical processing unit, uh, they, they used one by NVIDIA uh, and found that the performance and the, uh, the price to performance ratio really favored using GPUs. So direction that we really need to go with this is having uh, computing centers in a way or, uh, or cloud computing approaches to be able to actually process the positions that we need if we're going to do this in a more uh, community-driven open access way using, using uh, uh, and more open source tools. And a, beginner, a beginner's guide kind of uh, important to think about whether you really need pads. They're the best. There's so much you can do with them. They have all the information there, depending on the resolution, of course. Uh, but some questions can be answered without pads. Uh, need to check the funding situation uh, because if it's good, you will need a lot of receivers and a differential GPS to get very precise positions of your receivers to make sure you know exactly the down to the centimeter where that receiver is. Uh, and if you really have enough money, maybe pay someone to generate pads for you because boy, oh boy, can it be, uh, can it be challenging. Uh, do you have a supercomputer? Uh, it will take a lot of time for realistic data sets. Uh, the ones that we're using often have many fish uh, swimming for days, weeks, years, uh, uh, it's going to take a long time to generate accurate positions and, and crunch those data. Any computing upgrades you can afford will really save time and, and be worthwhile. Uh, hopefully you know your study system very well. Uh, not every study system is created equal for positioning. Uh, study system means both the, the, the animal that you're tracking and the, uh, the receiver array or the location where you're doing the tracking. Loss or movement of receivers can be catastrophic. So uh, if you don't, if you know, if you don't moor a receiver well enough, or you, even if you moor it well enough and it gets blasted out by a rock rolling down a river, uh, that node in your network uh, may, uh, may mean that you can no longer get precise positions from triangulation because there's you, you have a big gap in your array. Uh, noise interference can limit it can that limits range can be frustrating. Uh, boat noise. Uh, wind, rain, all those things can, uh, biological activity like shrimp, as I mentioned, all those things can just totally destroy a, a really well laid out plan. And animals that exit the array will be impossible to study. So you may have a perfectly designed array. Uh, it, may, it may have great coverage and you may just tag fish that, or, or turtles or sharks or, or whatever, or seals that just do not want to stick around that array and you get 10 seconds of data before they're gone forever. So understanding your study species uh, and your study system is, is really important. 
and taking the time to test and making sure everything will be synchronized within the array is, uh, is very important. Uh, if you don't conduct tests, it can be very uh, risky and uh, uncertain whether or not you can get precise positions. You can fall back on imprecise positions using uh, methods like the centers of activity. But again, that's, uh, that's oftentimes a, a decision that's made as a trade-off between the time that it takes, the resources that are available, and the, the importance of having precise positioning for certain questions. And that is everything that I know about positioning. So thanks. Thanks, Robert, very much for such a lovely <laughs> overview with many examples. Yeah, you can see many clapping hands. Yeah. <laughs> great, great, great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much again. And I believe that we can. The pleasure we can, was all mine. <laughs> I think that we can launch the discussion. And guys, please, we uh, strongly encourage you to ask as much as possible. Maybe you know this Chinese proverb I mentioned during the last webinar. And the uh, proverb is saying that uh, uh, someone who asks right now may appear as a fool for five minutes. But the man who asks no question will stay a fool for the rest of his life. So go ahead, we've got one hand. John, please. Hey Rob, I super enjoyed that. You very rarely get such a, a topographical map of all the ways in which people seek to analyze uh, this data that I just sort of sit in warehouse all day. Um, I was very interested in the idea of using uh, CUDA and the, the GPU libraries um, and how we translate the power that that has into uh, something that we can put in the hands of individual researchers. So like in, in Python, the way that they've bridged this high performance computing gap is saying, okay, we know people on the client use pandas. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our high performance computing library and we're going to make it act like pandas. And but that was this big concentrated effort to make sure that something was usable for the end user and that they already recognized and understood. Who's going to do that? in R, who is, who is bridging, um, you know, the, the client level analysis, uh, client level data management or data manipulation packages and making them ready to leverage something like a, a bunch of CUDA cores or high performance computing cluster. Do we know? And how do we help them? Uh, really good question. It's something, I mean, if we were, you know, if we were sitting down privately, I would probably say something to the effect of, is this something that Ocean Tracking Network would be interested in taking on? Uh, because that's, I mean, that's a, certainly, I see a major role of, of internet, major international networks potentially uh, bringing these, these tools to the people. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare put you on the spot like that. I, I think it would take more than, than even just, um, well, our, our gracious hosts here at the ETN, and OTN and all the networks we can cobble together would still just be a small user group in the, in the midst of a larger user group. But like, we're going to have to look at this from a, a people who use the, the programming language perspective, I think, if we right. want to tackle it. But I, I'd love to be part of that process, as I'm sure our, our compatriots here at the Euro European Tracking Network would also love to be part of that process. So I'd be excited to contribute, but I know that it's going to be a big job to, to get these, these high performance tools into people's hands. It's a fascinating point. Uh, wish I had more to contribute on it uh, other, other than I agree and have not much to discuss about it other than uh, let's find a way. I, I yeah, you, your talk just completely energized me to try to, to chase this one down. So sorry to lead you down my, my specific rabbit hole, but I'm, I'm really, really glad I got to take this talk in today. Quick Thank discussion you so much. point. Okay, guys, who's next? 
Yeah, Tarin said his uh, thanks to basically Robert and ETN. So thanks, Tarin, but he's probably away. Okay, we've got two questions. No. Sharon, what's the hardest part with using triangulation to estimate locations of fish? So Sharon, please, can you speak yourself loud? Yes, <laughs> I'm a bit sick, so I'm trying to not use my voice, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I was just wondering, uh, Robert, what, why, why it is so hard to, to use triangulation? Because I always hear that, but I've never known why. Yeah, so uh, maybe a little, uh, a, couple, a couple thoughts on that. One, I think it's not really that hard. It fundamentally, uh, thanks to people that have worked really hard to develop the tools for us to have access to. Uh, um, a bit of a peek behind the curtain, maybe. The reason I have struggled with it so much, or we, because Saran and I work together, <laughs> is uh, we sometimes don't have enough receivers to put out in the ideal configuration and we start to stretch everything out and be like, well, maybe 130 meters is just as good as hundred. Then we can pack it. Then we could cover another, you know, we could cover extra ground. And then we look at the data later and it didn't work because we, we didn't get enough detections. And so it, it, the, the, the difficulty that we've had with it is that we don't, we just don't have, we're sometimes working with not enough resources to put enough receivers out to make it work properly. And we know that we're doing that, or I know that we're doing that, but we just don't have a great choice because we don't have an extra uh, $30,000 for more receivers and sync tags. So we just have to say, well, we have to hope it works. And if it doesn't, we will just deal with it later, but this is the best we can do. Uh, if you have enough receivers and enough sync tags, that you can have a really dense array and put your uh, put your tags in there, then it's I mean there's no reason it shouldn't it shouldn't work even even if you have really challenging conditions. Uh, it, it, I think it's mostly a function of the number of receivers that you have. If you have a, like ten meter distances from your receivers, you should be able to make it work in almost every habitat. Okay, nice. So it circles back to not having enough receivers then. It's a tra yeah, it's a tra it's it's a trade-off. I mean, even if you have enough receivers, sometimes you don't have enough resources to maintain them or deploy them safely, or you know, there's there's lots of reasons why it's struggle. I mean, as you know, it's it's time consuming to get out there and you know, imagine in, in the lakes we work in putting out 400 receivers. I mean, it would take us so long and so many moorings and there'd be so many buoys and and you know it would be logistically challenging. So it's okay. it's resource intensive to do really good triangulation. Okay. Thanks, Rob. And Gustav and David says sent uh, saying their thanks again to Robert and ETN as well. He also thanks ETN. So who's next? Folks, please ask. I'm pretty sure that many of you found themselves pregnant with a question or comment. Please. Well, during uh, Rob's presentation, I've heard uh, Rob's question about uh, transmission distance and tag power. So we've got Dave uh, from Lowtech and Eric from Telma here. So maybe guys want to say something about the tag power in decibels? Um, sure. This is Dave from Lowtech. Um, everything Robert said, Robert, great talk was, uh, oh, my camera's closed here. Everything Robert said was spot on. 
um, just maybe a little more color to the situation that um, the frequency of the transmission is going to have an impact on tag power. So you, you sort of highlighted that our low tech JSATs tags had some of the highest output powers. We actually have some that are even, even higher than that. Um, the, the main reason for that is those are at 416 kilohertz. And so the piezo size is really more efficient um, because we have a very small piezo, it matches that frequency. And so we can get such high power levels. But at that frequency, you have much higher attenuation in both freshwater and especially in salt water. So that's another, you know, impact mm -hmm. on your ranges. Um, and yeah, I don't know if there's any other questions I can speak to them specifically, but our, our tag power varies, you know, among tag sizes, tag frequency, we can adjust it as well for different applications and that sort of thing. What, what do you recommend when people say, I want a tag that will perform as well as possible for triangulation? Do you say, get the, the loudest tag you can, or is there a different um, piece well, of advice? Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll really vary on the environment. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you're in a river, we do a lot of work in rivers with our map system. Uh, the noise is, is quite a bit higher than typically than in an open, uh, you know, ocean environment uh, due to the water rushing over sand and rocks is generating a lot of noise. So in those situations, it's typically essential to use what we, what we brand as high power tags. Uh, but in, let's call them quieter environments, um, you can typically get by with a standard power type of tag. So it's gonna really vary on the study objectives, you know, including the, the actual application, the environment that, that's being worked on. Okay, I would I would have assumed naively, obviously, that uh, you would always want the highest power, and worst case scenario, you just get detections on more receivers, which strengthens your ability to triangulate it. Yeah, and that that's an interesting comment too. Maybe Henrik, I think Henrik's on the call somewhere. So he's, yeah, there he is, still on. Can can add some more color, but. You, you mentioned at one point, you know, having a very dense array, like receivers 10 meters apart. Um, I think you would, in that situation, although theoretically you could, you could pull out the best positions, the, the computing power required is going to make it very <laughs> yeah. difficult um, in filtering out the, like a lot of the erroneous detections you're going to get almost in that situation. Yeah, so now, now rather than, you know, having three or five receivers where your clocks had to be synced to you know, get a plus or minus two meter kind of position. And now you're gonna have all this other noise and it's like, well, what's not, not noise per se, but you know, what, which of these detections should we not actually be utilizing for this position? Cause you got mm -hmm. 15. So yeah, more is not always better, but you never want to be on the fringes of your detection envelope. So if you go out and range test and you're getting 500 meters, you know, doing a positioning array at 400 or 300, you know, it is not going to be a problem. Doing that 10 it probably is going to be a problem. <laughs> Spacing. Oh, that's, that, that's really, really good information. Thank you. Yeah. H Henrik has a lot of experience in that, I think, area. He's coming. Here he is. I <laughs> just had to move the black screen there. I almost agree with you, David, but in, in my experience, I mean, it's never really an issue having too many hydrophones. I haven't experienced that yet. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone's putting them 10 meters apart, though. I'm saying if, you know, if that was done, I think you, 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 you crossed the line there. But yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. No, no, with we, we, we have done that in a Norwegian yeah. river where we wanted a very tiny, tidy space. And it worked great. But uh, it, of course, it is more computive, computer intensive if you have more hydrophones. But that's not really a deal breaker, in my view. Okay. Use as many as possible. <laughs> well, there's certainly a, you know, a, some sort of uh, reward, <laughs> benefit, reward yeah. sort of uh, yeah. scenario where, you know, you, you'd probably be better off actually expanding the array at some line. Yeah. But You're, a conservative right. approach, Robert, and all yeah. is, is typically 
the the way to go especially if your range testing occurred on a you know calm afternoon or something right you don't know yeah. when those which it always go does by. you don't know when it's going to rain it, it completely yeah. changes the acoustic environment uh waves crashing on rocks so it's better to People range test it. over a longer period of uh time to get more of the different environmental characteristics that'll occur yeah, people don't love range testing when the, the wind is choppy and pouring rain. Yeah. Range testing is great on a calm day in the sun, lying in the boat. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you hit, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head too with things like other noise sources like boat traffic. If you're working in, I don't know, St. Lawrence and you have ships going through constantly that have uh <laughs> you know, just all sorts of sounding equipment to, to really chart the bottom so they're not hitting anything. Um, yeah. That's gonna impact I things. I know Andy Danilchuk has done some work in uh, Puerto Rico and they found, they, they did a, a big analysis of their range based on synchronization tags and they found this strange pattern on days of the week. And they're like, there's no reason for days of the week to affect transmission. And they realized it was because on the weekends, everyone's out in their boat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, that Mallorca study you showed, they that was in a, a like me, a marine protected zone, I believe. Yeah. Um, I was out there with them for a few days. So there is the odd boat going through that and, and it would um, cause a, you know, so, somewhat of a brief lull um if they had sounding equipment on the motor noise not not as really important there okay. um but pretty quiet um typically mm. those tags were pinging at two to five seconds basically uh, if i right. recall yeah consistently no randomization right okay what was the battery life on those uh well it depend on the size but um they were trying to target, if I recall correctly, like I think it was about a two or three months. Um, that was like they, they did it over the summer. So yep. the, the larger tags would have been pinging at like two seconds. And then the, the smallest ones they used were more like five to get that sort of life. Okay. If, if you program them at, you know, 15 or 20 seconds, you can extend the life out quite a ways. Yeah. Hmm. Very cool. Uh, guys, uh, Dave and Rob, uh, do you consider this question settled? <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to keep talking if you have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we've got one. So, Jake, do you want to read it loud or do you want me to read it? Or it's quite long. <laughs> Yeah, hi everyone. Um, sorry if I cut out, my internet is being a bit weird. So that's why I tried to get it into the text. Um, sure. Rob, you mentioned that um, centers of activity are often used to sort of create pseudo trajectories or pseudo positions. Um, what I was interested in was if you found any way that people sort of parameterize the error around those positions, because instinctively you'd think it would be tied to something like detection range of your receivers. But if you're using a sort of amalgamated weighted average position from several different receivers, each with potentially their own detection ranges, depending on where they are, um, how you calculate the sort of imprecision around that center of activity, uh, it seems a little bit more complicated to me. Um, and I don't really, I've not really seen anyone deal with that, uh, you know, robustly in a paper. Um, and I think that has some pretty important implications for any sort of state space model or whatever you want to then do to your pseudo, you know, your centers of activity, which sort of rely on quite careful parameterization of the error. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if you had seen anything, uh, seen anything sort of more involved in trying to deal with that imprecision have not seen anything. It's a really good point. 
when I've done centers of activity on, I, I've done centers of activity on sync tags, just out of curiosity. And basically I get a position or a, a center of activity at almost every location within the triangle. Uh, so I think the error of centers of activity probably scale with the size of the uh, grid that you have. And probably centers of activity will be much more accurate if you have a denser grid. Uh, but you mentioned state space models and things like hidden Markov models. I would never recommend anybody to do anything like that with centers of activity or a pseudo path because you, you don't, you're not actually getting step lengths or turning angles that are reliable in any way from a center of activity. No, I, th I think that's a good shout. <laughs> Having said that, I pointed to the, the Marlin data at the beginning and the tuna data in the open ocean with only one or two detections per day. Um, the error on light-based geolocation tags in the open ocean is quite large and the resolution is relatively poor with only one or two detections per day, but you can see behaviors emerging from those data. So like everything, it is about scale. So depending on the scale of your study system, I have no doubt that you could get centers of activity at certain time intervals that give you reliable information about behavior that you could use in state space or hidden Markov models, uh, for example, uh, simply based on the fact that if you, if you have a big enough array and you zoom out enough, you are getting, it, 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 it's a fractal, like I said, I mean, you're just you're just getting a different resolution of time and space and you have to know about your study species and study area in order to determine whether or not you can get reliable information from a path based on centers of activity or other ways of imprecisely positioning animals because I, and you have to remember as well that i mean triangulation is not a precise, a truly perfect method of positioning. We're, everything that we're working with is some sort of gradient approaching the actual position. But uh, I showed the, the French study, look, basically finding that they got pretty good positions within two to five meters of, of where the animal actually was. And you know that's pretty good. Uh, depending on the size of the lake or the ocean and the, the behaviors of the animal, uh, two to five meter positioning could be way too inaccurate. If you're working in a tiny pond, you're like, well, I actually have no idea where that animal is because it's only you know, 10 square meters. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm losing the thread here. You get the point. It, it just depends like everything. It's, it's all a matter of scale. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Cheers, Rob. Rob? Hello. I just was going to make one more comment to you since you seem to be very interested in uh, some of the physics and other parameters that impact, you know, detection efficiency and whatnot. Um, another consideration, you know, which which probably has less of an impact in, in sort of marine environments, but somewhat more significant maybe in, in river freshwater watersheds um, is the propagation of the acoustic signal. So, mm. so essentially all the tags that I'm aware of utilize a, a cylindrical piezo ceramic as the, the speaker, if you will. And that signal pattern that the propagation is a is, is very similar to a dipole in electromagnetics. So if you think of a donut, mm. um, so if, if you had a cup like a glass that's your cylinder where you would pour the water in the cup that's your null and there's really no signal going in those two directions like at all so when we talk about the db the power 
coming off the tag, that's in the optimal direction, like in at, at the perpendicular to that piezo in the donut. Um, and so tag orientation, really what I'm saying is piezo orientation within a fish, you know, if it's in the peritoneal or whatever it may be, um, ha has an impact on, on this, right. you know, to some extent. So like our, our JSATS tags, we put the piezo um, perpendicular to how we do it in basically all of our other fish tags. And the reason is typically used in, in, in rivers and um, you want that signal basically propagating up or and down river, <laughs> which yeah, is the yeah. direction the fish's head tends to be pointing, uh, the juvenile salmon, right? So just another factor that you can go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. So would spherical tags be optimal in, in theory? So yes and no, um, because there's no free lunch. I think you said that in your yeah. computing section. Um, and what that is. means is, so if you're putting out some, some measurement of power, let's just say it's one watt um, hmm. of power. That would be a lot, but let's just for argument say one watt. If you're able to focus that in a beam like a laser, you have all the one watt going in a beam. And if you have it in a donut, you have all the watt in the donut. If you have it in a sphere, yeah. well, now it's more spread out. So the tag's actually weaker now in the optimal direction. So it's not necessarily beneficial. Um, okay. It would be if you had like some sort of 3D acoustic array in deep water in the ocean. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can but I, we tend to work in really in two dimensions in a lot of ways. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. In incredibly useful information. <laughs> well, call me anytime. <laughs> yeah, no, I really appreciate that. Really good value added. I have to run. So thanks for the talk, Robert, and thanks everyone. My pleasure. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Dave, for your for your input. You know, it's great. You have manufacturers here as well because you know it's. You know, otherwise, it would be you know rather rather theoretical. <laughs> With you having you here, it's like you know putting it to um, a real background. Thanks. No Bye. problem. Yeah, th thanks, Ruben. Ruben, thanks, thanks. <laughs> Great CID. Okay, okay, I think guys. People generally enjoyed it. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I went over my time estimate, though. It's okay. No, there was no, no, no limits. So, so guys, more questions. Don't be shy, you know. <laughs> thanks, David, for your thanks. <laughs> so, Robert, you've got a question in chat. <laughs> John likes the shirt. <laughs> That's a pretty great shirt. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, I can't, I couldn't possibly comment on Telemetry Fight Club. Understandable. Okay, guys. So, in case we don't have more questions, so we will probably close the session in a while. But still, you have a you have a chance to ask. Is, is everybody familiar with the OTN study hall on Thursday nights? It's very good resource. Yeah. John, do you want to post something in the chat about the Slack oh. or something? Yes, absolutely. I will. Um, so we we are meeting tonight. Um, you can shoot us a note if you want to get the link to join that. And it's, uh, it's not as, as in-depth as we just experienced, but if you're having, 
your own problems or, or questions about telemetry analysis, uh, folks like Robert are hanging out and and helping answer those questions, which is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very deeply indebted to Robert for making his time available like that. So, um, you know, some of you have been there before, but um, shoot me a note or to otndc at dal.ca and we'll get you the link for tonight. It goes off in about two and a half hours. And uh, there's also a Slack channel that you can join if you want to do some asynchronous uh, queries with your friends. Um, we have about 120 folks that uh, hang out in the Slack channel and help one another out, specifically with coding problems, but not uh, restricted to those. We've had a lot of good uh, mm -hmm. study design questions come through there as well. Sounds great. Sounds great. And I'll post something just a sec. Also, let me let me advertise the ETN training school that will be held next year, probably in the Czech Republic and probably in May, with a topic of positioning of in, in acoustic telemetry. So, in case you are interested, uh, you will receive an invitation through through email. You know, once this is planned to to too much details. Uh, just for preparatory purposes, Marie, uh, is there funding through ETN for people to participate or should we be seeking funding for students yes, and people yes. to... ETN cover uh, the travel funds and accommodation. So, yeah. And hopefully, you know, the meeting in person will be possible in May next year. Keep our fingers crossed. Agreed. <laughs> I'll be there. Great. Ah, okay, Joan. No, I mean, uh, uh, these are great resources for people looking to learn things. I mean, I've learned so much with that group. I want to make sure that people are aware of it and join it and benefit the way I have from the Slack channel and the, the OTN uh, study halls and everything and the ETN training schools and everything. I mean, I think, I think everybody should be interested in engaging with the community. Like that's one of the strengths of having ETN and OTN is, is connecting people and providing resources. Like I, I, I tell students that I have and people that I work with a lot, like we're doing incredibly difficult things that many people uh, don't know how to do or or haven't even invented yet. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're developing methods and we're testing methods and we're, I mean, we, we need to rely on each other in order to make that work. It's really, really hard stuff, I think. I mean, I didn't, I didn't learn this with great ease or rapidity. <laughs> Well, so it seems that we have no more questions. So thanks everybody for joining us today, for being here with us here. And thanks again, Rob, for this beautiful talk you gave us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. So, yeah. I was so thanks thrilled to do it. And see you around. So. Be well, bye -bye. everybody. Thanks Everybody. so much for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good weekend and hopefully to see you, you know, soon during our training school in, in, in May in Czech Republic on positioning. Okay. Yeah, and some, some people at the ETN meeting in Northern Ireland. Ah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, it will be. Hopefully. <laughs> Brilliant talk, Robert. Brilliant talk. <laughs> Very yeah. kind. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so I guess that I can stop uh, recording.